The examination is not complete without an assessment of the cardiovascular system for signs of right heart failure, which can be secondary to chronic lung disease. The examiner looks for elevation of the JVP. If there is evidence of right heart failure, auscultate the heart, feel the liver and look at the legs for edema. For the gastrointestinal examination, the patient should lie on one low pillow. This helps relax the abdominal muscles. For the examination of the abdomen itself, the patient should be exposed from the mid-chest to the symphysis pubis. The general inspection is a chance to look for wasting or cachexia, jaundice and restlessness or drowsiness that may indicate hepatic encephalopathy. The examination in detail begins with the hands. The nails are inspected for clubbing and whitening, leukonychia, which are characteristic of chronic liver disease. The palms are inspected for reddening, erythema, and contractures and thickening of the flexor tendons, Dupuytren's contractures. The patient is asked to extend the hands at the wrists and to maintain that position for 30 seconds. Inability to maintain this position leads to a flapping tremor called an hepatic flap, which is a sign of hepatic encephalopathy. The examiner now inspects the arms for bruises and scratch marks and the upper arms for spider nevi. The examination now moves on to the face. Look for jaundice, especially in the scleri, and for the conjunctival pallor of anemia. The examiner looks carefully at the mouth for numerous possible abnormalities, including pigmentation and telangiectasiae. Smell the patient's breath to assess the presence of the sweet smell of fetal hepaticus. Just shrug your shoulders up a little bit and now relax them down. Just relax, that's great. The examiner now feels for enlargement of the cervical and supraclavicular lymph nodes. This may be the time to assess the auxiliary lymph nodes. Swing your legs around this way, please. Swing your legs over the side of the bed. Okay, and just relax your arm nice and heavy in mind. Let me take the weight. That's it, nice and relaxed. Nice and heavy on this side again, that's great. That's great. Now inspect the chest for breast enlargement and loss of body hair in men. Look for spider nevi. The abdominal examination begins with a careful inspection. Just want you to take a couple of deep breaths in and out for me. Abdominal masses and distension may be best seen from the side. Masses such as an enlarged liver may be seen to move as the patient breathes in and out. The examiner looks from above for abdominal scars, bruises, abnormal pigmentation and visible peristalsis. Palpation is performed after the patient has been asked if there are any tender areas. Is it sore anywhere in your tummy? Okay. It should begin superficially and be performed in each region of the abdomen. Mm -hmm. 
After deeper palpation in each quadrant for masses and tenderness, the liver edge is sought under the costal margin. Palpation begins from the right lower quadrant using the radial side of the examiner's right hand. Let's take some deep breaths in and out for me. Percussion is used to estimate the liver span. The spleen is assessed in the same way on the other side. The examiner then attempts to blot the kidneys. One hand is placed in each lumbar region in turn and the other under the patient's side. The lower fingers flick upwards briskly while the other hand waits for the kidney to float upwards. Okay. Now I'd like you to roll onto your side towards me. If the, spleen is not if the spleen is not palpable when the patient is lying flat, the examiner rolls him or her to the right and tries again. Listen with the stethoscope for normal, reduced or increased bowel sounds over the liver for a hum and over the renal arteries for breweries. The abdominal examination is not complete without examination of the inguinal lymph nodes and for hernias. It's going to fill into your groin here and your glands. Now uncover the legs to look for bruises, edema, and if suspected, signs of alcoholic peripheral neuropathy. The examination should finish with a rectal examination and if indicated, a cardiovascular assessment. The cranial nerves. The examination of the cranial nerves is best performed with the patient sitting over the edge of the bed. Begin with the usual general inspection of the head and neck. Look for craniotomy scars, neurofibromas, facial asymmetry, ptosis, proptosis, skew deviation of the eyes or inequality of the pupils. The cranial nerves are then examined roughly in the order of their number. The first, olfactory nerve, can be tested with bottles of substances with non-pungent smells, but it is usually enough to ask the patient if there has been any problem with his or her sense of smell. Have you noticed any problems with your sense of smell? No. The second, optic nerve, is tested first by assessing visual acuity. Don't forget to include the shoulder girdle in your inspection, if he normally uses them. Each eye is tested separately, while the other is covered with a small you card. Hold that out at arm's length, and read the lowest line that you can see clearly for me. L C Y R E H B. Fantastic. Okay, we'll just swap over. If you can cover your eye there, and just hold that one out. L C Y R E N B. Terrific. The visual fields are examined by confrontation using a hat pin. The examiner's head should be level with the patient's head. Just cover head. up your eye for me. Each eye is tested separately. Just keep focusing on my nose. I'm going to introduce this pin into the field. I want you to tell me as soon as you see it, say yes. 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 Excellent. We'll swap over. Okay. And again, just keep focusing on my nose. If visual acuity is very poor, the fields are mapped using the fingers. Yes. 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 If possible, the lights are then dimmed to enlarge the pupils, and the fundi, and especially the optic discs, are examined with the ophthalmoscope. 
Begin with the plus 20 setting, which should bring the cornea into focus, and gradually rack down to naught to see the fundi. The patient should stare into the distance. The examiner should use the right eye for the patient's right eye and the left eye for the left. The third, fourth and sixth nerves control pupil size and eye movements. The examiner should note the shape, relative sizes of the pupils and any associated ptosis. The examiner uses a pocket torch and shines the light from the side to gauge the reaction of the pupils to light. Assess quickly both the direct and consensual responses. Look for an afferent pupillary defect by moving the torch in an arc from pupil to pupil. Test accommodation by asking the patient to look into the distance and then at the hat pin placed about 30 centimetres from the nose. Now assess eye movements with both eyes first, getting the patient to follow the pin in each direction. Look for failure of movement and for nystagmus. Ask about diplopia in each direction. Is he double at all? No. Very good. The fifth nerve has sensory and motor divisions. Begin by testing the corneal reflexes gently and ask the now, patient no if touch the touch, touch of the cotton of wool on the cornea can be felt. And just to, um, tell me if can the sensory it. component of this reflex is the fifth nerve and the motor component the seventh. Now look over this way slightly. And just tell me if you can feel Test it. facial sensation in the three divisions, ophthalmic, maxillary and mandibular. The front here? Yeah. Test pain if sensation with the pin first and, yes and map any area of sensory loss from dull to sharp. Yes. 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 Test light touch as well so that sensory dissociation can be detected just if present. Um, touch very uh, gently with the cotton. Just get you to say yes when you feel it. Yes. 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 Examine the motor division of the fifth nerve by asking the patient to clench the teeth okay. while you just feel the masseter to, um, muscles. Clench very hard for me. Then get the patient to open the mouth while you attempt to force it closed. This is not possible if the pterygoid muscles are working. A unilateral lesion causes the jaw to deviate towards the weaker, affected side. Test the jaw jerk. This is increased in cases of pseudobulbar palsy. Now test the muscles of facial expression, the seventh nerve. Ask the patient to look up and wrinkle the forehead. Look for loss of wrinkling and feel the muscle strength by pushing down on each side. This is preserved in an upper motor neuron lesion because of bilateral cortical representation of these muscles. Close your eyes nice and tight for me. Squeeze them tight as hard as you can. That's great. And Ask the patient to show his or her teeth and look for asymmetry. Now test hearing, the eighth nerve. Whisper softly a number about 60 centimetres away from each ear. Distract the other ear by rubbing your finger lightly over the other auricle. 14. 14. Now perform tests to differentiate nerve deafness from conductive deafness. Rene's test involves the use of a 256 hertz tuning fork. This is placed on the mastoid process and then moved near the external ear. Since air conduction is better than bone conduction, it should then sound louder, unless there is conductive deafness. Can you feel it there? Yes. Tell me, is it louder here? Yes. Weber's test involves use of the same fork placed in the centre of the forehead. The tone should seem to the patient to come from the middle of the forehead. If there is nerve deafness, the tone is heard more on the side of the normal ear. If there is conductive deafness, the tone is heard better on the side of the unaffected ear. Examine the external auditory canals and the eardrums if this is indicated. The ninth and tenth nerves are examined together. Look at the palate and note any uvular displacement. Ask the patient to say ah and look for symmetrical movement of the soft palate. A unilateral lesion causes the uvula to be drawn towards the unaffected, normal side. Test gently for sensation on the palate, I'm just the ninth the back nerve. Of your throat. It is not Tell really necessary to test the gag reflex. Ask the patient to speak to assess for hoarseness and ask the patient to cough. A bovine cough suggests bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve lesions. The twelfth nerve supplies the motor supply to the tongue. Like to just have a look at your mouth. While examining the mouth, mouth, inspect the tongue for wasting and fasciculation. Next, ask the patient to protrude the tongue. 
Stick your tongue out. With a unilateral lesion, the tongue deviates towards the weaker, affected oh. side. The 11th nerve provides the motor supply to the trapezius and sternomastoid muscles. Look over towards the wall, push against my hand. And look over towards this way, push against my hand. That's fine. Look for torticollis, test the strength of these two muscles on each side. The neurological examination of the upper limbs. Begin this examination by asking the patient to remove his or her shirt and to sit over the edge of the bed. Hello Richard, nice to see you. Um, I'd like to examine your arms, if you wouldn't mind taking your shirt off and sitting on the edge of the bed and, and I can do that. Examine the motor system systematically every time. Inspect for wasting, both proximally and distally, and for fasciculations. Don't forget to include the shoulder girdle in your inspection. Okay, I'd like you to put your arms straight out in front of you like this with your palms up and then close your eyes and just hold them there. Ask the patient to hold both hands out, palms up, with the arms extended and to close the eyes. Look for drifting of one or both arms which can be due to upper motor neuron weakness, a cerebellar lesion or posterior column loss. Also note any tremor or pseudoathetosis due to proprioceptive loss. Feel the muscle bulk next, both proximally and distally, and note any muscle tenderness. Do you have any pain? Test tone at the wrists and elbows by passively moving the joints at varying velocities. Assess power at the shoulders, elbows, wrists and fingers. Okay, just shrug your shoulders up for me please. Push up hard. Okay, that's good. Shoulder abduction. Ask Next, the patient to abduct the like arms that. with Hold the elbows flexed firmly, and, and resist your attempt down. to push them down. Adduction. Ask the patient to adduct the arms with the elbows flexed now, and not to allow you to separate them. Your sides. Heart. That's good. Thanks. Elbow flexion. The patient should bend the elbow and pull so now, as not to let you straighten you it. You. Pull hard. Yep, harder. Okay, it's good. And now, I'd like you to put your thumb towards your face and pull up again. Pull up hard. Okay, relax. And try this side. Pull towards you. Okay, relax, change the angle. Thumb up towards your nose and pull towards you. That's it, good. Extension. All right. The patient should bend the elbow and push so as not to let you bend.